Hey there, guitar fanatics. You know, getting to rip a solo over a set of blues changes is some of the most fun you can have with a guitar in your hands. And the blues is sort of a rare musical idiom these days where guitarists still have the chance to stretch out and express themselves. And there's so many styles and ways to go about it. The thread that runs through it all is a simple set of chords, a guitar, an amp, and a guitarist's ability to bear their soul and express themselves to their listeners. Today, we're going to look at several different approaches to using scales and arpeggios over the blues. If you're just getting started with blues playing, this is really going to help you build your vocabulary. If you already play some blues, well then this can give you some more choices to get your message across. This is all about helping you play great blues solos in the style that you want to play them, so you can get the most fun and enjoyment out of this great style of music and this wonderful instrument. By the way, there's a link in the description below to my course, which is a deep dive into all sorts of uses of pentatonics over different kinds of blues. Now, let's play some guitar. So let's get right into our level one technique, and that is to use the minor pentatonic scale of the one chord over the entire progression. In a typical 1-4-5, 12 bar blues, we're gonna be soloing over three chords, and it's usually three dominant seven chords. Let's play in the key of A today, and we say 1-4-5 because we're using chords that have the first note, the fourth note, and the fifth note of the A scale as the root of that chord. So the one chord is gonna be A7, that's the first note in the A major scale. The four chord is D7, and then the five chord is E7. Now there have been countless great blues solos that use this approach just using that minor pentatonic of the one. And while some folks might look down on this approach for being overly simplistic, I'll tell you this, you've got to have your phrasing and your timing down to make this approach sound good. And why does this approach using a five note scale over all three chords, why does it even work? A minor pentatonic has the notes A, C, D, E, and G. Now in the key of A, we should also be able to call these notes by their interval names, and that is the root, the minor third, the fourth, the fifth, and the flat seven. Now let's take a look at these chords. A7 has the notes A, C, E, and G. And right from the jump, we can see we have A, E, and G in the a minor pentatonic scale. So we've got three of the four chord tones for A7. And we're gonna employ a little trick whenever we play the C or the minor third. We're gonna bend it upwards towards C sharp, which is the major third. We're gonna make it fit a little better over that one chord. And we don't even have to bend it all the way up to the major third. As a matter of fact, it kind of sounds cooler and a little sassier if we don't. We're almost just kind of implying the major third, and it sounds like this. How about the four chord, or D7? Well, D7 has the notes D, F sharp, A, and C, and A minor pentatonic has D, A, and C, or the root, the five and the flat seven of D7. So we have three or four chord tones there. E7, or five chord. E7 has the notes E, G sharp, B, and D. And we'll find we've got a D and an E in A minor pentatonic, so we can lean on those notes pretty hard, along with the G which sounds super bluesy over that E7. Great, so we've got a lot of good notes to play, and I wanna show you another little trick we can use when we've got sort of a limited number of notes that we're using, and that's called call and response. And that's the idea of starting a statement with a little musical motif and then sort of answering yourself, having a musical conversation with yourself, if you will. For instance, over the first four bars, I might open my solo with a little statement like this. And that would be the call, and then I can answer myself with something like this. Over the next four bars, I might use that same call, or I might spice it up just a little bit. 
and then a similar response. And then over the last four bars, I'd probably play something completely different, a little more complex, kind of turn up the heat a little bit to make a statement. If we think about it, isn't that the way the lyrical structure of so many great blues tunes works? Think about Red House, where he starts with the line, there's a red house over yonder, that's where my baby stays. Then he repeats it, then it comes to the last four bars in the turnaround and he changes it completely and says, I ain't been to see my baby in 99 and one half days. Well, now we're using this similar device with our guitar solo. So let me take a run through 12 bars using just the minor pentatonic of the one chord and our call and response device. Here we go. idea of this video is to keep adding layers to the notes that we can choose from. Layer two is to play both the major and minor pentatonic of the one chord over our progression. Now, if you don't know this trick, there's a really easy way to find patterns for major pentatonic, and that's to take any minor pentatonic pattern or lick, move it down the fretboard three frets, and you've converted it from minor to major. So here's A minor pattern one at the fifth fret. We drop that down to the second fret and we've got A major pentatonic. Now the notes of A major pentatonic are A, B, C sharp, E, and F sharp. Or we could say the root, the second, the major third, the fifth, and the sixth. Now this scale is going to work particularly well over our one chord because we've got A, C sharp, and E, and that's an A major triad embedded right in the scale. We're also introducing two awesome color notes. We've got the second or the ninth, which is B, and we've got the sixth or F sharp. Now the great Albert Collins used the ninth and the sixth a lot like this, where he would play the ninth into the root and the sixth into the fifth. Both the ninth and the sixth have an unfinished kind of a sound that just sound fantastic when you resolve down to one of those chord tones. So now we're really starting to target specific notes to help tell our story. So what we're gonna do as a strategy, we're gonna use our A major pentatonic over the first four bars. In bars five and six, we're gonna to convert to minor pentatonic. And then in bars seven and eight, when we go back to our one chord, we're gonna use major again. The last four bars, we're gonna bring it home by using A minor pentatonic to make a strong bluesy statement. Let's give that a try over the backing track. So we've done just the minor pentatonic of the one chord and we've done the major and minor pentatonic of the one chord. In level three, we're gonna take it up another notch and we're gonna add the major pentatonic of the four and five chords, E7 and D7 in our turnaround. So much of what makes great blues playing appealing is the mixing of major and minor tonalities and we're really gonna start getting into that now. What I want to give you here is a template for knowing which scales to use where. Now this one is my own personal preference. Of course, you're free to use whatever structure your ears gravitate towards. But I grew up listening to a lot of Southern rock, so that major tonality is pretty appealing to me. 
That being said, we've always got to bring it back home with the blues, something minor, or else it can start to sound a little bit hokey. So here's our formula to get going. We're gonna go major for the first two measures and then switch to minor of the one for our response. We're gonna go minor pentatonic of the one over the four chord in bars five and six. And we're gonna go back to major in bars seven and eight when we go back to our one chord. We're gonna use the major pentatonic of both the five and the four in bars nine and 10. And then we're gonna go back to minor pentatonic of our one over the last two bars. So I'm gonna play through the backing track twice. The first time through, I'm just gonna play the scales themselves. It's gonna sound really clinical, but you're really gonna be able to hear the chord changes. In the second pass, I'll play an actual solo, but I'll be very strict about using the scales in the appropriate places that we've laid out. Let's have a listen. Okay, now that was fun. And as you get more accustomed to playing this way, not only does it sound great to mix major and minor like that, but it is fun and it really keeps your head in the game. Now, so far we've mixed major and minor by playing different scales and their notes separately and distinctly. Kind of like, here's major, here's minor. But for level four, we're gonna start mixing major and minor tonalities in the same lick. And there's two ways that we can go about it. The first way is to sort of keep thinking about major and minor patterns separately, but to blend them together. And you might need to practice this a bit, but what you're gonna find is each box you go to for minor pentatonic, the major pentatonic sort of overlaps it. So it's pretty easy with a little practice to start to run them together, blend them and make up licks. For instance, in the fifth position, we have A major pattern two and A minor, pattern one. Now I'd recommend just messing around on a few strings at a time at first. Something like ascending through major on the top four strings and then descend through minor. And we can start to hear licks like this. Now that's a cool sounding lick, and in my mind, we're still keeping things kind of separate, still doing sort of a call and response with one part major, one part minor like this. And we can also mix major and minor with a simple trick, and that's to work the major third into our minor licks. So let's play frets five and eight on our B and E strings. And then we're gonna grab the C sharp or the major third at fret nine. Go back to our root and play down to the C at fret five of the G string with A minor. Then play again C sharp at fret six, our root A and then the flat seven G at fret seven and five on the D string. Check out how great this little lick sounds over all three chords of our blues. Here it is over E7. Here it is over D. And here it is over A.
Now this fits so well over each of these chords because basically we're playing a dominant seven arpeggio with this little pattern. We've got the fifth, the flat seven, our root, and the major third. And then we've also got that minor third for a little of that chromatic bluesiness. Now I'm gonna take a solo over the backing track and incorporate this approach into our sound. More than likely, I'm gonna work the sixth and the ninth from the major pentatonic scales in there also. Let's give it a try. So we're getting deeper and deeper into this thing. We're adding more complex harmonic options, but we're always striving to still bring things home by playing something bluesy. On level four, we saw that by adding the major third to the minor pentatonic scale, we could get all four notes of a dominant seven arpeggio. In level five, we're gonna add two more arpeggios into the mix, minor seven arpeggios and diminished seven arpeggios. Now we could also find places to use major seven and minor seven flat five arpeggios, but this video is gonna get way too long, so we're just gonna stick with those first two today. Now it's one thing to know how to play an arpeggio, but the real trick is knowing where to play these arpeggios in the blues. So let's take a little trip down theory lane, break that down, starting with minor seven. The rule is we're gonna use a minor seventh arpeggio up a fifth from the root of each of our chords. Now, why is that? We know that each of our chords in a one, four, five blues is a dominant seven chord. And we should know that a dominant seven chord is the fifth chord in some key. Now we're calling A7 our one chord, but A7 is really the five chord in the key of D major. You should also get familiar with a chord progression that we call a two, five, one progression. This is super important if you ever want to start playing jazz, or in this case, the more sophisticated side of blues. In a 2-5-1 progression, the two chord is minor. So in the key of D, the second note is E. So the two chord would be E minor seven. In the five chord in the key of D, the fifth note is A. So the seventh or the fifth chord in the key of D is A dominant seven. So we've got E minor seven and A seven. And in the key of D, that would go back to D major. But playing blues, we're gonna make up licks using the arpeggios of that minor two and the five seven chord. We're not gonna worry about going home to D. Or we can just use the arpeggio of the two chord, that E minor, and then any of our other concepts. That sounds awesome implying that two to five chord change like that. Now how about a little lick like this? And we can apply the same rules to D7. Now D7 is the five chord in the key of G. D is the fifth note in the key of G. A would be the second note in the key of G, so A minor seven would be our corresponding two chord. So over the D7 chord, we can play A minor seven into our D7 ideas. And E7 is the five chord in the key of A. B is the second note and the second chord of the key of A. So our B minor seven arpeggio, that's what we would play in tandem with our E seven ideas. How about diminished seven arpeggios? Well, there's two places that we're gonna use them. Over the one chord when we're going to the four chord and over the four chord, going back to the one chord. So here's the trick with diminished. When we use these arpeggios, we're gonna to have to use the arpeggio up a half step from our root. So for A, 
going to D7, we're going to use A sharp diminished. And for D, going back to our A7, we're going to use D sharp diminished. So essentially, the harmony that we're creating sounds like this. And that's what we're going to be implying with our lines when we incorporate those diminished seven arpeggios. It's a great sound. Now there's lots of shapes we can use, but for the lesson today, let's just use this very familiar shape on the top three strings. So we've got an A sharp here at our sixth fret, and the shape is, I'm going to play the ninth fret, the sixth fret on the high E string, I'm going to play the eighth fret on our B string, and then the ninth fret on the G string. We could also go down to the sixth fret on our G string. And the great thing, of course, about diminished is we can move our ideas up and down the fretboard in minor thirds or three frets at a time because it's a symmetrical scale, and that would sound like this. And we want to make sure that we practice resolving from our diminished into the chord that we're moving into. And in each position, for instance, of our A sharp diminished seven arpeggio, as I move it up the fretboard, it's going to be super easy to find a D chord shape or a pentatonic pattern to flow into. So for instance, here we are at the sixth fret, and I could slide up one fret and I've got D major, or I could drop down a fret, and there's a D shape here at the fifth fret. What if I go up to the ninth fret? Well, I've got D right here at fret 10. If I go to fret 12, I've got D at fret 10 again, or at fret 14. Lastly, if I go to the 15th fret, I've got that shape at the 17th fret, or I could drop to the 14th fret. And that's really the trick with diminished. We want to make up all kinds of licks that sound like it's just flowing into that next chord. Let me take a stab at incorporating these arpeggios into a solo over the backing track. Check it out. So there you have it, five layers of techniques for playing solos over a 12 bar 145 blues. I hope you got some really great ideas from this video. As I said earlier, I do have a course available, the link's in the description below, and we talk about how to use pentatonic scales in many different ways over both major and minor blues. I've also got a Patreon page now at patreon.com forward slash Charlie Long where we'll be going deeper into the concepts that I discuss in all of my YouTube videos. I hope to see you there. And in the meantime, work hard, play hard, have lots of fun with your guitar. I'll see you soon.